If you have an interest in horses and love learning more about horses, the horse industry, teaching, or even managing your own horse business, then you're in the right place. We would love you to join us on our mission, which is to improve the lives of horses around the world through the education of riders, handlers, and trainers. So get comfortable, listen in, and enjoy. Today's guest, Heike Holstein. Heike is from Dublin in Ireland, and she's a triple Olympian. So she's ridden in, I think, 1996, 2000, of course, in Australia, and 2004. But the difference with Heike is that she then had a break. So she had a break, had two children, stopped international competition, and has more recently come back to international competition. So we're going to talk to her about riding at a high level having a break and then coming back and competing at a high level again. But before we do that, I'd just like to remind you about the motto of International Horse College. The motto is people safety and horse welfare. So if that's the way that you feel when you're working around horses, have a look at the website, internationalhorsecollege.com, registered training organisation 31352. Now today, Heike, are you there, Heike? I'm here. I'm here. Good morning. Perfect. Good morning. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Look, I'm very happy to have you on. And, you know, we've got quite a few different things to talk to you. And I think you'll relate to quite a few of our listeners. You know, we often have a vision of doing something with horses. And of course, kids slow us down and, um, you know, wanting to come back and wanting to start riding and competing again. I'm sure that you're going to have a few tips for our many listeners out there that are, are in that sort of situation. But before we even get started, I'd like to ask you for a favourite quote, which is, you know, a favourite quote or a favourite saying or something that you find yourself continually saying as you teach. Is there something that you've got that you'd like to um, say? Well, I, I teach a lot of people from different areas of the horse world. So show jumpers, inventors, dress jazz riders and all different ages and sizes and skill levels. So something I say, I tend to say a lot is just to be patient, mm-hmm. you know, to not rush it and have um, have patience with your horse and have a system where, you know, you can learn and your horse can learn and to be patient and take your time. That's, I find I say that a lot in all disciplines. You know, it's interesting because we have this favourite quote fairly early and people can say, oh, I can resonate with that or not. But you know, I think if we go through your horse career, which we will, I think that's something that you have done is being patient, taking your time, yes. you know, still still having that long-term vision and long-term goal, but um, waiting for it to come to you rather than chasing it, if that makes sense. Yeah, 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 yeah. that's right. Yeah. Now, I could dress arch. You know, were you always a dress arch rider? I wasn't. Um, I grew up, we have a horsey family, Um My brother is a show jumper and I did everything as a child in Ireland. I was in the Kildare Pony Club. I did cross country for my school. I did show jumping for the Pony Club and for the school. And we hunted a little bit and did everything as well as doing dressage. But as I got a bit older and as the fences got a bit bigger, I I got more nervous. (laughs) and didn't enjoy the jumping quite so much when the fences got the the same height as I am. Okay. So I just veered down the, the dressage route um, just because I enjoyed it. And I, I wanted, when I was small, I always wanted to go to the Olympics. And then I made a decision. I said, I, you know, I don't want to be terrified doing this for the rest of my life. I definitely won't be able to go to the Olympics if I'm scared. Mm. Um, so it just, it just naturally fell into just more flat work. I still jump a little bit, but nothing, nothing huge. <laughs> okay. Okay. Now well, let's talk about just people being in the horse industry and, and, Skills aside, because they can be learned, but the type of person that they are, what type of person makes a good horse person, good person to be around with? They're working with horses, riding horses, competing, but their core strengths and, um, you know, the character traits. Oh, there's there's many. You know, you need empathy with the animal. You need to be able to, to feel with the animal. And I think that's important. You need to be able to connect um, as a teacher and a rider, you know, every horse is different. They all have different personalities and you need to be able to train them accordingly to their personality and their past experience. I think you need determination, mm-hmm. patience. <laughs> um, there, there's a lot of things um, that, 
that 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 you need working with animals and that's the the tricky thing about our horse sport is you know we don't have a board or a machine under us we have a live animal under us that is they're all different and they're all unpredictable and have their own minds yeah and when you think about those core skills and character traits is it to have someone who's going to, you know, ride in three Olympic Games or be a top competitor because, you know, you're rubbing shoulders, I'm sure, with many, many other top competitors. Is it more of that or is there something else that the top competitors and specialists have? I, I can only speak for myself. Um, mm. Yeah, the, the determination, um, you know, you have to want it because it's a lot of hard work with horses. Um, it's expensive, it's time consuming, so you have to really want to do well. Um, perseverance, um, skill, knowledge, there's a lot of factors kind of. <laughs> mm, mm. Is that kind of what you're Yeah, I think so. I think so, you know, because we have, you know, like you had a dream to go to the Olympics, but lots of people have that dream. Oh, luck. You need a bit of luck. <laughs> okay, luck as well. Okay, okay. Yeah. And then making the decision then to have a career with horses, because I'm sure that that decision came before you actually rode in the Olympics or not. I don't know. But to have that career, you know, to say, well, I want to go out and it's not just all about me and my horse and riding at the Olympics, but I want to go out and start teaching people, you know, making that decision to help others. Was there a decision there or was that just a natural progression that people asked you for your advice because you were better at it than them? Um, it, it was a bit of both, really. Um, mm-hmm. so after school, I went into university and I didn't know what to do. I always wanted to work with horses because I love working with horses. But I was very shy as a young person. And when people asked me for help, I, I tended to, when I started out, just teaching people who were younger than me because I felt really intimidated teaching people who were older than me. And... So I went into university and I have a honours degree in business studies, which was business studies was kind of a bit of everything in business. But I just knew I couldn't sit in an office and work inside for the rest of my life. So more people kind of started asking me for help. And the more I helped people, the more confident I got and the less shy I got Mm -hmm. and the more I did so it was a bit of a progression that way and also a bit of something I knew I always wanted to work with horses I love helping people and you know I I did my AI pretty early on and then I did there's a coaching uh, Horse Sport Ireland have a coaching um, course in Ireland that you can do which different levels which teaches you how to coach and I'm now a tutor in that helping other people learn how to coach and things like that make you more confident and and then, and I love teaching. I, it's, I'm so happy I have a job that I love doing and I love yeah. getting up every morning. Yeah. I yeah. think that's important. I was going to say, what's the best thing about the whole working with horses? Is it because you have a job that you love and a job that you'd be doing even if you weren't getting paid for it? Yeah, definitely. I think horses need, they're a passion. Yeah. <laughs> and you have to love it because it's hard work and expensive and time consuming. And I do love it, thank God. And I also like helping people. You know, I, I love when somebody comes for a lesson and they finish the lesson and the horse and the rider are going better and are happier than they were when they started. Okay. I okay. love that. Yep. Yep. Now, riding at, um, I think, first of all, Atlanta, then, of course, Sydney and um, Athens. Tell us a little bit about, was that on three different horses? It was. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So we, we were, uh, my brother and I were very fortunate. We had a lovely lady who sponsored us when we were younger from mm-hmm. 1994 to 2000. Then the contract was up. And so we could afford to compete and have lovely horses under us. Um, and then in Athens, I rode a horse called Velt Adel, which I bought as a three-year-old. He was ginormous, which is what he's famous for. He was 18 too, and I called him Tiny. <laughs> and uh, I I got him to Grand Prix and he was a, because I'd schooled him all his life, he was a real gentleman. Um, so that was the first horse that I trained from baby up to Grand Prix. Okay, okay. He was. And, yep. uh, yeah, he, he was lovely. He taught me an awful lot. And after that, I, I always produced one or two horses 
Mm-hmm. Always mm-hmm. had one, you know, that I'd get as a young horse because grown horses are very expensive or anything, you know, mega talented and nearly at that level, they're very expensive and I can't afford to buy one. So I kind of always make, try to make one you know, by, by a foal or a young horse or and bring it on. Because you had it quite a break after 2004 from international competition. Yes. From 2004, when you rode at Athens, then that long break, what happened there and, you know, when did you start riding again? Tell us a little bit about that story. So the biological clock was ticking. <laughs> <laughs> um, I got married in 1999 and... Uh, I have a very patient husband, but, uh, you know, at some point in mo- a lot of women's careers, not just the horsey world, the, you know, you, you, you have to you decide, you know, a, you want kids and then you have to get going <laughs> at some yep. stage. And I was in my 30s and uh, I said, right, you know, this is it. I'm going to do it now. Um, it took a little bit longer than expected to to get pregnant. Um, but thankfully, I was able to, or we were able to. Um, so that's that's what I did. So Jake was born in 2006. I sold Tiny. Um, he went to America. And to, the beginning, of, I sold him in 2005, but he went in early 2006. Jake was born in September 2006. And then I, I always had horses, you know, at home. I was riding here. I had uh, lovely horses at, and nationally in Ireland. Um, and then... Jake was born and nice little baby and cute. And then, oh, God, <laughs> he needs company. So I, had, so I had another one and he was born in, Archie was born in 2009. Okay, okay. So that sort of explains, your, explains your long break. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. And then coming yeah, and back. I didn't have a horse, yep. I didn't have a horse, Glennis, to ride yes. internationally. Yes, You know, I, I had sold uh, Tiny in as I was, you know, trying to get pregnant with Jake mm-hmm. and I didn't have another horse. So that, that was the main reason I wasn't internationally, but I had horses here on the national circuit um, and riding and teaching. So I was very active, just not internationally because I had no horsepower. The horse that you came back in to international competition in, you bred that horse? I did. Mm. Um, I had a lovely mare here that I bought as young horse and it was basically an experiment. I said, you know what, I'll, we're not a stud farmer, or, you know, we're not breeding. Um, so mum had seen a lovely stallion at a show in Germany. She's an international dressage judge called Samarant, who's by Sandro Hitt. And mm-hmm. I said, OK, we'll give it a go. And uh, Zambuca was born in 2009, just before Archie was born in 2009. And yeah, and she she always she's a very powerful horse and Riding her as a young horse, I always felt, Jesus, this feels like a Grand Prix horse. You know, when she trots off, it's like, <laughs> it's like driving a Ferrari. Um, and she won every national championship at every grade here, you know, from a five-year-old up to Grand Prix. She won the prelim championship five years, four or five years later, she won the Grand Prix champion, national championship mm-hmm. at age nine. Wow, wow. Four oh, years, four yeah. years later, sorry. Yeah. At, five, yeah. she, at five, she won the prelim championship and at nine, she won the Grand Prix championship. So it took four years. She's very clever. Wow. So just thinking about your horses, you've had so many special horses. Is there one that's a standout? Is that the one that's a standout or not? Have you got one that's a standout or are they all just stand out, whichever one you're riding at the time? Yeah, I love them all. I think Tiny or Velta Adel, because of his size, mm-hmm. I, and he was he was quite he he was a he was a bit of an idiot, you know. He was high maintenance. <laughs> I think he had nine lives. <laughs> okay, and and he was a bit of a handful sometimes to handle. But he he was the first horse I produced from from a baby. Yeah. So he has a you know I had him a long time. I had him ten years. Okay. Um, that's a big chunk of my life. <laughs> and and Zambuca is special because I bred her. The yes. First and only horse I've bred that that okay. has um, been so successful. Yeah. And just getting, you know, getting to a stage and just to get to the stage where you're riding at an international level. Now, we've talked about money. So money aside and, um, you know, if you've got the right horse, what are the challenges? You know, I'm thinking for our listeners, you know, who might have, you know, lovely foal on the ground now, a lovely horse that they'd like to take internationally. And they haven't got any money, of course, but, you know, we're not going to talk about that. But what other challenges are they likely to face in that journey? Um, Time. (laughs) 
<laughs> yep. Time is one of my biggest challenges, you know, with the children. Um, you have to, you, you want to spend time with your children. You need to spend time with your children and you need to spend time training your horses and earning a living. Um, so time is a big challenge and because we live on an island and we're far away. So there's different procedures in Ireland. We need to qualify to compete internationally. So we need to get certain percentages in Ireland before we have permission to compete abroad to represent Ireland. Um, so that's the first kind of challenge. You know, you need to, if you have a horse in Australia and you, and, you know, you, you want to compete internationally, you need to get it up to the level because mm -hmm. international dressage, if you're an adult, starts at Pre St George. Yep. So you need to get your horse to that level. And then I'm sure Australia has procedures where you need to get certain criteria yes, to be able and to qualify qualifying events. Sure, but, sure. Yeah, I think every country has that. Mm, mm, um, mm. So that would be the next challenge. And yeah, and then to go international and and compete. Um, it's um, Ireland is quite small relative to the rest of the world in the horsey world, in dressage especially. So it's a huge shock to the system when you go abroad <laughs> because yes. there are many, many people riding a Grand Prix on many lovely horses and they can all ride really well. Mm -hmm. um, whereas in Ireland, you have a few riding a Grand Prix and you see them every weekend. So you get it, you're in a little bit of a bubble <laughs> and then yeah. you go around abroad and you're like, oh God, <laughs> this is different. <laughs> this is a different one. Okay. This is different out here. Yes. So yes. And the standard is very high. So you have to up your game. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What do you think? You know, I mean, you, I know you said the standards high, the horses are lovely, I'm sure, brilliant riders. Was there one moment where you went, oh, no, I'm up against some really good competition? In my first international show, my first international show that I rode at in Germany was in Hamburg. Mm -hmm. So in 1994, I was very lucky to um, be invited to train with Dr. Reiner Klimke in Germany. Wow. Yep. Um, my mum knew him personally a little bit and he came to Ireland to give a clinic and he taught me and he said, you know, if you'd like to come, I'll help you. And he had no other pupils um, because he was a uh, lawyer and very busy and he rode in the mornings and at lunchtime. And um, because I had time, I just finished university. Um, I lived out there till the Atlanta Olympics and that was a huge learning curve for me. But my first international show was Hamburg and there was... I think there was 40-something in the Grand Prix. Mm. There was Isabel Vert, Monica Tedoresco. <laughs> you know, I was like, oh, my God. I remember talking to my mum when I looked at the starter list and I said, oh, my God, the only person I've never seen on TV is me. <laughs> 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 I was really starstruck. And you're warming up, you know, with people like that riding around you. And, it, yeah, your jaw just drops. You're like, oh, my God. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Amazing. Um, yeah, <laughs> I'll never forget that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I, ended, I think I ended up 10th in that class. So oh. I was like, that was, yeah. wow. <laughs> That's not too bad. Yeah. I'm delighted with that. Yeah. 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 Now, thinking about um, your coaching, teaching, you know, teaching your riders that you have, and I know that you teach a wide variety, but is there a common theme? And I know you've, you've talked about patience, but if you're going out, you know, say you're going to a workshop or a clinic next week and you're going to be there, and you first see all the riders and all the horses, what's your first lesson usually about? You know, these are riders and horses that you haven't had before. Do you have like a theme that you often see this thing that you'd like to fix first before you can go on and fix anything else or teach first before you can go yeah, on and teach? That, that, would, that would be the basics, Glennis. Mm. Um, there's, you know, the, we, we all abide or should abide by the training scale. Mm -hmm. um, are the scales of training so the listeners can you can google that there are yep. six things in the training scale and they're like the six commandments in riding yes um, in all disciplines so we're judged according to those we ride according to those and we train according to those and there if you're riding your horse at home and you don't really know what you're doing have a look at the scales of training and see if you can tick those boxes okay you know and, and they are vital because without those you cannot do what you want to do so you know number one is rhythm that's the biggest you need and then there's relaxation acceptance of the contact impulsion straightness and then collection comes in medium level mm -hmm. um, but the first five riders of all levels need to strive to achieve okay 
Okay. I think that's good. So um, we might put that training scale in the links as well, just so people can go back and have a look at that and say, right, these yeah. first five, you know, the, the rhythm, relaxation, connection, impulsion, straightness. Okay, perfect. Yeah. And whatever yeah. discipline, you know, if your riders are just um, riding for fun or, or do a little bit of jumping or cross country, you need those those five things for all disciplines. It's not just dressage specific. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. What are you looking forward to now? Tell us about, you know, what competitions you've coming up or what students you've got or, you know, even how your kids are going. Or, but just, you know, the next 12 months, two years, what are you looking forward to? Oh, lots of things, luckily. So we, uh, I was part of the team at the European Championships last year with Julie Reynolds, um, Anna Marvod and Kate Dwyer and myself, where we qualified Ireland's first ever Olympic team for dressage. Mm -hmm. Um, so that was a huge moment, and so we're looking forward to that next year. <laughs> um, can't wait for that, and hopefully that will be on Zanduka. I'll be riding her. Um, so that's me personally, what I'm looking forward to. Um, Teaching-wise, everything is, like with riding, and probably in Australia, everything is on hold here at the minute. Um, so I am the dressage coach for the Young Rider eventing team for a while now already so we had we were looking forward to that the European Championships for that which has now been cancelled that was in Hartbury in England um, and there's no shows or anything on at the minute so and there's no teaching at the minute in Ireland because we have travel restrictions mm -hmm. and so there's a you know so everything is on hold at the minute but when it does start back there's that there's we will have shows back again in Ireland and my pupils would like to compete at those, so we'll be aiming towards those. Okay, okay. Look, I, I am looking forward to talking to you again and, and to see how you're going, how you're going, how your students are going. Do you have any young horses at the moment, Heike? I do. I have a nice, we don't have many horses because I do all the work myself, the mucking out and feeding yes, and, yes. you know, into the field, out of the field and stuff. So I don't have any staff. The staff is me. Yes. <laughs> so I, I have... I have one young horse, a lovely six-year-old by First and Bal that we bought as a foal. We used to have her mother. Okay. And um, we bought her just when she was, you know, just weaned. And she's absolutely gorgeous. She's very green because I haven't had time to really ride her. <laughs> um, because I've been traveling so much with Sandu the last year. And at the beginning of this year, I was lucky to get two international shows in just before um, all the travel restrictions came in. Um, so I've the good thing is I've had loads of time to ride her, and she's she's going to be lovely. Mm. She's called Forget Me Not. Oh, lovely name, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So that, that's it. Yeah. Now, just to do with mums getting back into riding after having a couple of kids, just tell us a little bit about something that is going to help them. Anything at all to help them get back into riding after they've had kids. I think. If you can, there's a few things. Um, so first, you have the jelly belly. Yes. <laughs> after you've written, you're just like, after you've had a child, you're, you're, and you've had a bit of time off, you're like a big jelly. So to be safe, um, it depends if your horse has been worked or not, <laughs> and you feel like a big like a big jelly baby on the horse. So just do a little bit and take your time and get a, you know back to fitness and getting stronger. And the other thing I found nice to start with and then extremely frustrating was having the kids around while I was riding yeah. <laughs> so you know you have this idea like oh the children will be around in the yard and they'll just sit in their stroller while I'm riding and <laughs> that doesn't really happen <laughs> you no. know? it happens for a while until they can rummage around and they get a little bit more independent and then your time is torn between watching what they're doing and stop them waving whips around and playing footballs against doors yep. and things while you're trying to ride so that drove me nuts for a while. So uh, somebody to mind your children while you're riding so you have a bit of peace and a bit of, you know, riding is a bit like therapy as well. Um, you want a bit of me time and to be able to concentrate and have quiet. Um, so it's it's like somebody else going to a coffee shop and having a coffee. Um, that's me riding. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So children, not when they get to a certain age, not at the arena. <laughs> yes. And have some quite quiet, quiet time <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and be able to concentrate and love what you do without yeah. any distractions. 
Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. 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 No, I think I think that's quite a few good hints there to um, to help the mums and. You know, I'm sure that people would like to contact you even to talk to you about that, but certainly to talk to you about. Now, how far will you travel? You know, I know you're not travelling at the moment, but do you travel to teach? And I know you travel to ride. You know, if people did need to contact yes. you internationally, um, yes. what would be the best way to contact you, Heike? Uh, well, my email address is Heike Holstein, the number is 02 at yep. gmail.com. Um, or I'm on Facebook or on Instagram. Um, you know, so people can email me at any time. I have I do travel to give clinics. Um, I've been to China and I've been to America because um, I, I love teaching. Um, and if you can see a little bit of the world at the same time. Yes. Great, but I yep. love teaching. I'll teach anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, thank you. It's very good talking to you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And and I think what you're doing is amazing. You know, I think you're just a horse person and, you know, a horse person that has got the determination. Have You want to do well. You are persistent and, um, you know, having done so well and then, you know, as you said, maybe not stop riding but kept going until you got the next horse up there and, and competing. So I think you've done very well there. And, you know, along with two kids, I think you just keep juggling it all and, yeah. and keep going. So I think you're a great role model to, um, to many mums, to many females with what you've done. So thank you for coming on the show and hopefully we'll talk to you again soon. Super. Thank you, Glennis. Thanks for having me. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. If you've enjoyed this chat, then please comment, rate and subscribe. If you'd like any changes or recommendations for guests, then please contact us through horsechats.com. And while you're online, have a look at the government accredited courses at internationalhorsecollege.com. Registered Training Organisation 31352. Remember that our comments and instructions are general in nature and do not take into consideration your individual horses or your individual ability and circumstances. If you enjoyed this podcast, then please leave your comment below.